Here we go. Three, two, one, go. Don't forget, Don't forget you gotta get a ball. In the net. Oh, perfect. Did you run out of the So she invited me to vacation Bible school. Has anybody ever been to one of those? Mm. 
Woo, BBS, right? So I had I didn't know what this was that about. I honestly thought it was like a camp, but um, it was all week long and it was around lunchtime. Everything we did during that time, I was ready to have fun, I was ready to play these games, I was ready to win like a free night at skating, all the different things that they had going on there. But before we would start a game, they would pull out this book and they would kind of tell a story from this book. And it was applicable to what we were doing maybe, like winning or friendship or love or whatever it was that we were talking about that day. And so a little bit later on before lunch, they'd pull this same book out and we would read from it again. And it was this Bible. So that was really my first exposure to the Bible was seeing them pulling this out and using it throughout the entire day, not just before they went to bed. And so it was the first time that I had actually seen, I had heard about the Bible, I had seen it on other people's tables. Uh, like I said, a grandparent would say something about it, and aunt, but I had never really been exposed to it, and I never had one in my own hands. So at that, at that vacation Bible school, I had mentioned to Brother Steve, who was running it, that I didn't have a Bible, that I thought it was pretty cool that we were reading from this Bible, and I didn't have one. And a couple weeks later, I was invited back with Kelly, and I went on a Sunday morning, and Brother Steve was there, and he was like, go ahead, hey, Tanya, Tanya, I'm trying to hear I got something for you. And he presented me with a white Bible. I still have this thing. It's in my trunk. Had it all these years. White cover Bible. And I just loved this thing. I thought it was so neat. And it was, again, my first time of actually opening this up, reading it, and trying to see how to apply it to my life. So today, we have a big task of going through the Bible. Now, I've had this Bible for years and years to be able to read the different books of the Bible and go through it. But now we're just going to have to try to run through it during this, this session right here with us. So, Stephen, can you help me? Just pull this out a little. <laughs> Woo! Wait a Look at this, y'all. Corey's been hard at work. Happens. 
Yeah, then it just and all went downhill down, down, from there. Down, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it was God, and then he started speaking. He started speaking the world. And he said, let there be light, and there was light. So just with his words, he was creating the earth and everything in it. He created man. He created animals. He created plants. He created all of that. So just with his voice, he created everything on the planet and beyond the planet. So I have a planet here, and we're going to put it on Genesis. Our lovely assistant here. Let me do that for us. Okay, and so he cre he created everything on the earth. So everything would include us, right? It would include man. Does anybody remember? Has anybody read how he created man? How did he do that? He uh, created man uh, with his words. Mm -hmm. How was it? He created man to be in his own image. Yes, very good. He created man to be in his own image. But there was one problem, right? Mm -hmm. We were very flawed. He created us to be in his image, but we were far from perfect. Everybody knows the apple, right? Mm -hmm. It's kind of the symbol of how we are not perfect. It's the symbol of how we fell. And so we're going to put this one on Genesis as part of the Genesis story. So, in fact, throughout, pretty much all the way through, even through the four, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you'll see where man failed many, many times. Let God down many, many times. Turned his back on God and even Jesus many, many times. But guess what never happens? God never turns his back on us. God never leaves us behind. So in the story of Exodus, there's even, or uh, in the book of Exodus, there's even a story of how his children ended up wandering around and wandering around in the desert because they had turned their back on God. But the one thing in this book and in this great story is that God still cared for us. He still sent them food. He was still taking care of them, even though they had turned their back on him. Exodus. And then, let's see, in the first Samuel, right here, so we move along, we got first Samuel. And in first Samuel, you've got a hero. Does anybody know who the hero is in first Samuel? David, that's right. So David, we consider him a hero. And it was always the, the David and Goliath story, right? With a stone, he takes down Goliath. And Goliath was actually, we call him a giant, we call him a Goliath, but he was a nine-foot soldier. Nine-foot. How many of y'all have seen a nine-foot person? I have not seen one. Yeah, no, no, no. I am far from nine-foot. I'm like half of that size. So there's stories of heroism. There's stories that we can take from the Bible in which we can see where we can stand up and God will be with us. And one of the things about this story is that he knew God would be faithful and not leave him during this time. So let's put this one on 1 Samuel. So as we move along, as we move along, we see um, Isaiah. Let's see where we're at. Isaiah. A little bit further down, Isaiah. Right there, okay, so Isaiah. So in the book of Isaiah, we start reading and thinking about prophets. Does anybody know what a prophet is? What is a prophet? All right, and so in the book of Isaiah, guess what? The prophet's name was? Isaiah. Isaiah, right. So God promised that there would be a Savior that would come to rescue the world. As I said before, over here in Genesis... We fell pretty quickly from God. And then as I said, throughout here, you can see where we wandered from him. We've turned our back on him. And yet, like in 1 Samuel, you see that he's still with us. He will not let the giants defeat us. And then going on through here in Isaiah, he comes and tells us that someone is coming to save us. Even though we do not deserve it. We have fallen from him. We've turned our backs to him. All these things have happened, but he says through Isaiah that there is a Savior coming 
to save the world. So let's put the scroll on Isaiah. Alright, so now we have the book of Daniel. Y'all pretty much know what's going to happen in the book of Daniel, right? Has everybody heard the story of Daniel? Yep. Alright, so this was a guy who worshipped the one true God. And one thing to understand about him is that what's really fascinating, we know that he loved God and that he worshipped God and we know that he was thrown to the fire or in the lion's den. But why was he thrown in the lion's den? Does anybody know that? Like, everybody knows he went there and that God got him out of it. But why did he get put in there? He was thrown in there because um, the king requested that everyone bow down to him and Daniel refused to. Right. This was a time where the rule was you had to worship the king. They didn't, they didn't worship God. He said, you will bow down and worship me. And he said, no, no, no. I will worship the only one true God. And so he was thrown into the lion's den. And he bowed down and worshipped God knowing that God would never leave him. That no matter what, at the end of the day, God would never fail him. God would always be there for him and be faithful to him. And guess what? He was. So God rescued Daniel out of the lion's den. And so that, we, we're, we've moved through the Old Testament right here. And now we start with the New Testament. And at the very beginning of the New Testament... Between the old and the new, there's hundreds of years of time where we don't hear anything. We don't hear from God at all. It's kind of silence. We've heard from him throughout all these years, leading us, saving us, bringing things to us, teaching us all these lessons in the Old Testament. And then we don't hear anything. But then, in the, the beginning of the New Testament, there's two angels sent. Who did they go see? Who's the first? How does this start off? Two angels come and see a woman. Mary. Mary, yeah. So there are two angels sent to see Mary. And this is where she finds out that she is going to be pregnant. Or that she is pregnant. With the Son of God. That's kind of a great way to start a new, new chapter, isn't it? So, in the book of Matthew, that's where we find out that the Son of God is coming and His name will be Jesus. So we have a star here. The place. So the New Testament has 27 books in it. Does anybody feel overwhelmed that there's so many books and we're going to be going through them? It's a lot of books, isn't it? That is a lot. Has anybody ever went through the whole Bible by themselves? No. Tucker? Good job, man. Good job. All right, so the writer of the New Testament book tells the story of Jesus. So then we have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Who, who were they? Does anybody know who these four guys were? Tyler. Um, they were some of Jesus' closest friends. And, some, and, and two of them were disciples. Yeah. yeah, okay. So these guys were actually friends of him. They were walking with him. And they were seeing the story of Jesus unfold. And just like over here in the prophet of Isaiah, they said a Savior was to come and that he would save us from the world. And now we go into the New Testament, which I, it, just, it gives me chills when I think about this because it was said that a Savior was coming. And then look what's happening here. And at that time, can you imagine these people are walking earth and they don't have cell phones and they don't have TV, they don't have radio. They have just heard from prophets that a Savior is coming. And this man, Jesus, comes along on the scene, and he is saying he is the Son of God, and that he has come to save us. Can you imagine what, the, what kind of hope they had to give to those people who were following with him? And even then, just like we talked about with the fall of man, with us turning on him, even at this point, they're walking with Jesus on the earth. They're listening to his teachings. They're side by side with him, and they're still failing. They're still doubting him. There's still so many stories throughout this area right here, if we're going to read, in which they turn their back on him, they walk away from him, they question him, they do not trust him. And yet, he still is here, he is still coming to save us, and he still goes to, the, to um, save us. So, right here, the Gospels give us a glimpse of Jesus here with us. And so this is for Luke. And 
So even though we just put that on the, the book of Luke, we also learn in the book of Luke and throughout those books, Jesus' is power. We know that he came to save us. He's walking with these people. He's saying that he's the Savior. If someone came to you and said, hey, I've come to save the whole world. I am God's son. Would you believe them? No. It does. Can you imagine what it was like to be Jesus' brother? What was that like to, to live with this guy who says, <laughs> who says, I am the son of God and I've come to save the world. And you're like, whatever, throw a rock at him. You'd, I'd have to see some kind of evidence, wouldn't you? Like, you'd have to show me. I'd be like, so show me. If you're the son of God, what do you got? I mean, can you pull a rabbit out of a hat? What's going on? you got to prove it to me. And so in these books, he does prove it. There's healing that's going on. There's all kinds of things that are happening. And these people are actually seeing it with their own eyes, the power of God through Jesus. I think that's pretty neat. So there was a woman that was healed just by touching the robe of Jesus. She didn't even touch him. He didn't touch her. She touched his robe and was healed. Now, I think that would have convinced me. Would it have convinced you? Yeah, definitely. So this would go with what as well. All right, so John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Does anybody know what happens in the book of John? Yes. That's right. Jesus is executed. So now we've listened to the story. We, he was, it was told that he was coming to save us. Here comes an angel saying that he will be born to a woman named Mary. He walks this earth. He picks out his people. He does miracles. He leads and he teaches. And at, and at the end, he does tell them, that I've come to save you, and I will die for your sins. And so that's exactly what he did. And again, I always think about his brother like, what was that like? I think about Mary, I think about the people who were at the foot of the cross, who were there watching this happen. You've now fallen in love with this person who is a real person, who is God in a body on earth, and now they're being put on a cross. And so I can't help but think, too, in this book, when I'm reading it, like, but he's God. Like, he, he can just stop that, right? He could have just stopped it. He could have just ripped the nails out, jumped off the cross, healed himself, all is good in the world, right? But then what about our sin? That would have meant that we would have had to go to the cross. We would have had to have paid for our, our own sins. And he knew this the whole entire time. And so he went to the cross to save us from our sins. And that forever gives us a relationship with God. Forever. We're never separated from him because of that one event. So after, after his death, I would think that for the first couple of days, I, I probably would have just kind of been numb, been wondering, like, okay, he was the son of God, but he got put up on the cross and died, and now he's gone. Like, so what's next? But what happened? Did he stay in the grave? Did he come back? Did people see him when he came back? Did people actually see him with their eyes? Did they touch him? Can you imagine for the people that were here, like, as excited as I get to read that story about him coming back and about them seeing an empty grave and about them seeing him at the sea, seeing him throughout these areas, talking to him, as excited as I get, I can't even imagine what it's like for them. That's a super exciting part of this wonderful love letter that God has written us, to know that our Savior came back. That's the whole, the, whole new, the whole Old Testament is setting up the story of what's coming. And then we go all the way through. But at this point, he's resurrected. And he's here. People encountered him. People seen him. They touched him and they knew it was for real. They saw him die on the cross. And they saw him days later alive. And so his message from that point on 
for the rest of the all the way through is that our job is to go tell the story, right? Now these people were living in a time where it was super, super dangerous to tell the story of God or to tell the story of Jesus. That's why the reason why he was put on the cross. Those were religious leaders that put him on the cross. They they didn't believe in him. They thought he was crazy. You're not the son of God. You didn't come here to save us. I am the king. I've got this all under control, right? So he's asked us to take the word out and to tell others and to get people interested in this beautiful story. And from that point on, even some of them that, even though they walked with him, they doubted him, they weren't sure. I mean, they saw him and they kind of believed, but then after they saw him die, and then they saw him raised from the dead. That was it. They went out and told anybody and everybody that would listen. Probably even followed some of them as they were trying not to listen. That's who I would have been. I'd be like, no, 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 you gotta hear this. You gotta hear this. Look, look, look. I met this guy. And he died. And then he came back. And as you go through these stories, you'll find people who were persecuted, who were killed. Because they continued to carry the word. And to carry the story of Jesus and how he came to save us and how we do not have to be separated from God. They were there during that event, saw it happen. So let's put this on Acts. They started churches, they wrote letters, they did everything they can could to get the word out. So that's on Acts. And so then as you go through all of these. What do we learn in 1 Corinthians? What's in 1 Corinthians? What do we learn about in 1 Corinthians? We learn about love. So how are the books of the Bible relevant to our, our lives today? 1 Corinthians, we learn about love. So if we go to James 4, so we can learn about why we fight, why we quarrel. You get a fight with your sister or your brother? Well, not James. He'll tell you why. Why we fight. It's because of the evil desires inside of us. Right? What about fear? Does anybody ever fear anything? All right, me too. Has fear ever held you back from stuff? Yes. All right, so let me tell you that for 2 Timothy 1, 7 tells us that we do not live in a spirit of fear. We were not created in a spirit of fear. So when you fear, you can grab the Bible, and you can open it up, and you can read, and it can be applied to your life today. Like I said, fights, love, fear, all these things that we deal with on a daily basis, these are real situations, not just made up or somebody else goes to those things. These are things that are in our life daily, and we can learn them. And learn how to deal with them, learn how to resolve them, and try to reflect Christ even more through reading the, the book of the Bible. That is so cool. So how is it relevant? It's relevant, right? How many of y'all have actually used the Bible to figure something out in life? Have you actually opened it up and someone said, there's this great verse, if you go read it, it's going to help you. Mine was with the fear, because I feared a lot of things. I was always fearful of the future, always fearful about what people thought about me when I was in school. I was like, well, maybe these, these, this outfit isn't you know, nice enough, and what are they going to say? Uh, what if I don't make the team? I had all this fear, and that was always one of the verses that I could turn to. That's not who I was created to be, and that's how we can apply the Bible to our daily life. And so this, these books right here are just, I love, 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 love. We learn so much from here, but then we come all the way to the very end, Revelation. And in Revelation, we learn about Jesus' return. That's going to happen one day. And if you want to know what's going to happen in, your, in maybe your future, it could be your kid's future or your grandkid's future, but it's going to happen in the future. So it's pretty neat to read Revelation and to look and see what's going to happen and be prepared and to know what to look for if we see those signs or whatever it is. So it will be a glimpse when you read that 
book of what it's going to be like when Jesus returns. So we got a horse for that one. Revelation. So God is powerful enough to create the world. Right? So we saw that he created the world, he created man. He's always been with us, he's always providing for us. He's been there through some of the biggest fights and wars against some of our biggest giants. Then, even though we have failed and failed and failed and failed him, he sends his son so that nothing would separate us. His love and desire for us and for us to be with him had him where he sent his son to be with us and to walk this earth and to be an example of how we should be. And then he let his son die on the cross for us so that there wouldn't be a separation. So if God is big enough and strong enough and powerful enough to create the world and write this love letter, then who are we to think that he is not strong enough to be with us in everyday life? Who are we to think that we have the power and that we know better and that we don't need to crack this book open and read it because we've got this. We don't need any help, right? I think we do. And he knew all along that we would need this help. And that's why he wrote this book for us. So these words are from God for you. They were written by different authors different people throughout all this time, but it's all inspired by God. So do we have a verse? Well, I don't even know if we can see it. <laughs> can y'all see it over there? I can see it. I can see yeah. it right here. Yeah, the psalm. Oh, okay. Psalm 119. So it says, your word is like a light lamp that shows me the way. It is like a light that guides me. Your word is a lamp. So what does a lamp do? Light up a dark room. Okay, so light helps us to see things, right? See it in a better way. Have you ever been in a room where it's kind of dark and you can still kind of see things, but you've still bumped your toe on the edge of the bed because you didn't quite see as good? A little harder to navigate through a darker room. But if you turn the lamp on, it's all good. You got this. You can see. So his word... It's our lamp. It's our light. It's how we'll be able to navigate. It's how we'll be able to get through the rooms of life, through each phase of our life. I like to think about the phases of our life, like middle school is a certain room called middle school. And then when you get to junior high, it's another room. It's a whole different part of your life. Even if you've went through, Tucker, the whole Bible, if you've read the Bible from cover to cover, do it again. Because guess what? Each room of our life, each phase of our lives, the same book of the Bible will teach us something different. Because it will apply to different parts of our life at different ages of our life and through different things that we're going through in life. So you can always learn from the Bible. How many of you have a grandmother who loves to read the Bible? And you see her reading the, the Bible all the time. And so have you ever thought about like, wow, at your age, you've already read it like ten times. Why would you keep reading it? Like... Okay, put the book down. Find another book. Well, guess what? She is still getting lessons from that same book that she's read all these years. It's a different phase of her life or his life or whoever it is in your life that's reading that Bible that you know that they've read it multiple times. You're still getting something different from it. So I want to challenge y'all. We're going to be going through the whole entire Bible. I think it's going to take us until February or March. And it's August. So we've got a long, long time to spend in this book. But it's 66 books. So we're going to need all that time to go through it. Don't you think? Maybe we can skip the one that's all about who is who and who begat who. And that really boring book of the Bible that tells you how every person is related to every person. Maybe Corey, let us skip that one. But 
we're going to be going through all this. And so I'm going to challenge you that as we're doing this, I want you to get your Bible out. And I want you to try to follow along with how we're going along. And we're going to give you all the, all the tools that you need. We'll give you anything that you need to help to know what verses we're going through, what books we're going through, what chapters we're reading. And you can read these stories for yourself because here's another thing that I want you to understand at your age. Just don't believe what people tell you. Because people will just tell you what they want you to know. But I want you, and I'm going to challenge you, to read the book for yourself. And as we're going through these different books, and as we go through different chapters, and we read all these different stories, heroes, um, saviors, lion's dens, all these things, I want you to read the story for yourself and get out of it what God wants you to get out of that story. Because again, depending on who reads it, God is going to be giving them a different lesson out of each one. So don't just take what somebody says about the Bible or about a book, or they'll say, well, this was in the Bible. Go look. See if it's in the Bible. Always find out for yourself. And so I'm going to challenge y'all, again, to read, read, read. If you do not have a Bible, I think most of us here do. But if any one of you do not have a Bible, please let me or Corey know, because we will get you one. In this day and age, there's no reason for us to not have a Bible, right? And there's Bibles on your phone. We got the ones that I like my Bible that I can write in, and I can highlight, and I can put notes in it, and I can see it, and I can hold it, I can do all that. But then there's also one on your phone. There's a Bible app. But if you don't have a way to get one, please let us know, and we'll make sure you get one. So now we have worship time. Right? Miss Jalissa? All right, we're going to move on to worship, and then we'll get started into our small groups.